and one of the secret of mega churches is their ability to reach and retain men. Uh, as churches mm -hmm. decline, they tend to lose their men. You know, when, when Jesus started his church, he went out, remember what he did, he went out and found six men, six women, and he started a children's ministry, right? Okay. <laughs> no, he went out and found 12 regular guys, and he turned the world upside down with them. So what was he showing us? That he's a misogynist bigot? No, he was showing us that it starts with men. And then out of that comes diversity and growth. So if we take care of our men, if you grow your men, your church will grow. I'm spending money like I just got paid. Hundred dollar bills, tell them keep the change. Come on. Once women step up and lead, men step back and let them. Yeah, pop a bottle about to make it rain. Let me give you something now to celebrate. Come on. So what, what do we do to fix this? This philosophy helps women. And if you're wondering why I move the way I do, I just feel so good. Men who do the same are shame. So if your church is targeting women, who are you going to get? You're going to get women. But if you're targeting men, you're going to get men, women, children, sons, daughters. And so I say, target men bold. So the following is an episode of Ward Radio and does not represent the thoughts or the opinions of KHTS, its owners, or any of its affiliates, nor does it represent the official opinion of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. With that said, sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. So good. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I am your host, Cardinalis, and today I'm joined in the studio, actually not in the studio, I take that back, via the interwebs with a killer cast here, we've got Jonah Barnes, the Associate Professor of All Things Apocryphal, as well as a new author we're really excited to talk to, all right, David Murrow, who wrote the book that's on your screen now, Why Men Hate Going to Church. Jonah Barnes has literally been hound dogging me for months now, saying we have to get, we have to get David Murrow on the program. This book changed my life. Jonah, introduce our guest. Do whatever necessary gushing is in your system that you got to get out of your system. And then, David, we're going to jump right in and let you tell your story about why men hate going to church. Jonah, go. Okay. Well, well I'm I'm very excited to have David Murrow on the program. Uh, this, this goes back a long time. This is before I knew Carden. This is before when I was just a wee chap, a wee little chap. My father bought a book for me, Why Men Hate Going to Church. And which is kind of a provocative title, if you if you haven't noticed. I read this book when I was a young man, and and it changed the way I thought about myself, my relationship with God, and the church. It was a hugely impactful book. I refer to it all the time thereafter to people. I recommended it to a lot. I, I carried the book around all through college, and I would give it to people, say, you got to read this book. And I'm blown away that I still have the same copy <laughs> that, that I hauled around. I don't keep anything, keep track of anything, but I kept track of that book. Um, it changed the way that I viewed the church, and it helped me see the church through a different lens and see a lot of men in our pews who weren't feeling like they belonged and helped me understand kind of why and what I can do to help. And anyway, it was an awesome book. And so I reached out to David via uh, the, his website and he responded and he's still, he's still killing it, still writing more books, which I, now I have to go buy all these books now <laughs> and he tours around the world. So just, just so that our audience knows, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this book and you should all, especially if you're involved at all with the leadership of the church, elders quorum or bishoprics or young men. I highly recommend this book. You need to go find this thing. Um, uh, David goes all over the world uh, uh, giving speeches and talking about his research that he's done and 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 helping people get men back into church. There are couples and their families and there are young men the world over who have rediscovered their enthusiasm for the gospel of Jesus Christ, their energy, their, their faith and their energy because of the things that David has said and pointed out and his perspective is just awesome. So, okay. That's my gush. That's my gush about All right. David. So, so David, that's a big intro to live up to. And frankly, if you don't, I'm just stopping this whole thing. No, I'm just kidding. So David, man, that's a, <laughs> no pressure. You got some shoes to fill. No pressure, brother. So yeah, what's your story? Tell us why men hate going to church. Looks like it's not just an LDS thing. Fill us in my man. Yeah. Well, um, Full disclosure, I'm not a member of the LDS church. I've never attended an LDS church. I'm just your generic ev evangelical guy. 
Um, but uh, I'm a television producer by trade. And one of the things you learn in the TV business is that everything has a target audience. For instance, the target audience of ESPN is different than the target audience of home and garden television, right? Yeah. What is ESPN targeting? Men and uh, yes, the home and garden is for women. Well, I was sitting in church one day and I realized everything about my church was if my church was a television show, it would be on home and garden television. The uh, the words coming out of the math, the pastor's mouth were love, communication, beauty, relationship, nurturing, these sorts of words. There was a lace doily on the communion table. There were felt, felt and quilted banners around the wall. You got the lace doilies too? Yeah, man. <laughs> that, that, that's right. We don't have the underwear, but we've got the doilies. Um, and, and then there's uh, felt banners up on the wall. There's flowers. There's ribbons. All the ministries involved caring for children, cooking, caring for the sick. These are all wonderful things, but these aren't guy things. And so I counted noses in the room, and about 60% of the adult noses had lipstick underneath. And so I thought, you know, this, there's, there needs to be a book. There, there's probably a book about this. And I went on this brand new thing called Amazon.com and nothing. And then I went down to the Barnes and Noble and there was no books about it. And so I'm a television producer, so I'm going to make a documentary about it. And God put a stop to that. And he said, write a book. I said, I'm not an author. So I wrote the book and the thing blew up. I was interviewed in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. The uh, Chicago Tribune picked it up. I was on Fox News Channel, NBC Nightly News, CBC, NBC. All these different networks because I, I approached the subject from a secular point of view. I am a Christian, but um, I, I look at it from a sociological and anthropological point of view. My degree is from in anthropology. And so I looked at it from that perspective and it got a lot of uh, traction in the secular press. But it's since been used by um, literally hundreds of thousands of men around the world. And uh, it's been used in a lot of seminaries to train um, uh, men, pastors, how to reach more men. And uh, I would say most of the mega churches, there's at least one guy on staff who has uh, done that. One, one of the secret of mega churches is their ability to reach and retain men. Uh, as churches mm-hmm. decline, they tend to lose their men. So um, that's kind of the introduction where it came from and uh, what where Church for Men came from. Wow. wow. Now, I, I threw some things in the Discord card that we can show. Uh, for our radio listeners, we're going to put up a, some of the stats. We'll read them for you here. But in case any, so so Brother David is a Christian. He's not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, but his insights are absolutely applicable. And just in case anybody thinks that we don't have the same problem in the Church of Jesus Christ, I just want to put up some statistics here to make sure that we drive this point home. Okay, I the got first, your religious affiliation graph right here. Yeah, so the first is is a, uh, a study regarding uh, religious affiliation and demographics. This was a Pew Research study that did this. They looked at 12 different religions. This is North America. This is kind of the Western Western Christianity in North America. And they they uh, broke it out by men versus women. They found that atheists have the highest men to women ratio, like 70% to 30. Yeah. And then going down from there, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Jews are almost balanced at 50-50. And then evangelicals, Orthodox, mainline Catholics, Church of Jesus Christ is ranked, I think, eight out of 11. Okay. So we have a man problem in our church, just like just like our Christian brothers and sisters. We have the same issue. Uh, another uh, graph that I put in there, by the way, that percentage is 44% men to 56% women. So there's a 12-point gap there. Uh, the other graph that I put in there is also from Pew Research. This shows... Um, well, they asked r- questions of Christians and Muslims, religious attendance, daily prayer, importance of religion, and and what do you think about these things? And women overall crush the men in Christianity. They far more women say, "I engage in daily prayer," or uh, "I believe in heaven," "I believe in hell," "I believe in angels," things like that. Women are across the board far more uh, inclined to that than men are. And then the last graph that I put in here, and this is very important one that shows. We do have the problem, and the solution is very important. This comes from a study, uh, a Werner Haug and Yusuf Karbage and Paul Compton study at the Council of Europe. They did this in Switzerland back, I I thought it was in the time, 30 years ago. So, okay, he's familiar with this. So they did the study, and they tracked uh, religious affiliation generation to generation. They said, okay, so here's the family unit, and here's what they believe. We're going to look and see what their kids do. And what they found is that if you have a father who is active and faithful in his religion, 
the children are essentially 11 times more likely to inherit the faith of their father to also be active in their church. And it, it shows kind of this, it's a busy graph, but it shows that with a father active in the church, the percentage of activity and, and faithfulness in that religion goes way, way up. Uh, a one wonderful quote from Robbie Lowe, a researcher you're probably familiar with, David, who says, what happens if father is active, but mother is inactive? Extraordinarily, the percentage of children becoming active goes up as if loyalty to a father's commitment grows in proportion to a mother's laxity, indifference, and hostility. The, look, the takeaway from this is men are vital for the survival of a church and the perpetuation of a faith. That's the takeaway from this. So we have the problem in our church and we need a good solution. And that's why David is here. Yeah. So David, what are we doing wrong? It's obviously, I mean, it can't just be the doilies, you know, what are we doing wrong in general? And I say we, as in the entire body of Christ, obviously by the book you're writing resonating with Jonah so much, it looks like you got the same problems over there that we do over here. What are we doing wrong? And then what are your best and most effective solutions you've come up with in the long time it's been since you wrote this book? What are we doing wrong? What's the fix? Mm -hmm. Well, um, let me, again, I'm, I'm not active in the LDS church and don't know a lot about it, but one of the things I've always admired about your approach was the all-male priesthood and the sending boys on mission. Did you guys do a mission when you were 18? Buenos Aires North, two years. I was 19. It's generally 19, but now it's 18. 19? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I was Novosibirsk, Siberia, Russia. Yeah. Did you learn Russian? I did. Did you learn Spanish? Oh, claro que sí. Y no hablo español, hablo castellano. I don't speak Spanish. They speak castellano, which is their Ooh. very snobby and localized dialect, which is inherently better. <laughs> bueno, yo hablo castellano también. Hey, but so. um, we'll, leave, we'll leave it there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I always thought that sending young men into a virtually impossible task, winning a convert at 19 was a great way to cement the faith. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard the frustrations of men on mission. It's it's very, very difficult what you do. But what it does is it, it cements you into the faith. Um, evangelical Christians, it's a rite of passage. Evangelical Christians have forgotten about the importance of rites of passage. And so we just kind of slip out the back door. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to look forward to when we get older. Now, a few years ago, the church made the decision to send girls on mission. And I'm just sitting back thinking, uh oh because here's here's um here's a universal truth once women step up and lead men step back and let them and this is what we've seen in the mainline church churches such as the episcopal the methodist and everything the women have stepped forward to lead they're now you know preaching in church they're the board of elders and the men have said we're going to go play golf yeah. men do men do what they absolutely have to women um well let me put it this way when men when there are spots that only men can fill men will fill them but when women are admitted men will step back and say okay the women have got that i'm going to go do something i'm going to go where i'm absolutely needed so back to the question of mission um ever since i don't know how many years has it been since uh young women have been able to go on mission i don't know 10 years maybe well young women have always well for several decades i mean 50 years women have been able to but it there wasn't a big push until uh was it 2012 they yeah. changed the age the minimum it used to be the minimum age for service for women was 21 the minimum age for men was 19 and that produced a natural barrier that allowed there more you more younger men yeah. to serve what they really did was they kind of just made it for girls 19 and for men 18 now so there's far less of that natural barrier both males and females can do it while they're in college so they do okay yeah and what's what is the net result then are are more women stepping forward into mission service and are men stepping back that was my theory uh, what was that's, gonna happen? that's a great question i think you're correct but let me i don't want to say until i check out i, I don't know if there. i would jump quite i don't think that those stats are necessarily as correct for mission work simply because of the the, the social implications we've never had more missionaries in our church's history than we have in the past year but I have noticed a truth as I've seen a lot of my friends in the Methodist faith and in a lot of mainline Protestant and regular uh, traditional denominations as
because mm-hmm. they've done bent over backwards to not be bigoted and not be patriarchs and everything like that. They inherently have accidentally created a, a big fat banner as they've been trying to be welcoming to all the sound bites that feminism demands. They've and put those on the banner they've kind of accidentally simultaneously put like no but like boys not wanted here (laughs) you know what i'm saying they've they they've sent some mixed messages so i would be curious to see how that data applies to the church of jesus christ latter-day saints because our um our missionary service is in many ways very much a rite of passage but it is also so much more youthful than maybe other missionary opportunities and so much more codified than maybe other missionary opportunities in other faiths i think it's a little bit more on. I don't want to say autopilot, but um, I, I would. I would have to. I would have to get more data before I felt comfortable making some kind of assumption. But at large, I think your thesis that uh, the North American Church bending over backwards to try and prove that it's not bigoted has majorly resulted in a decline of interest in men because really it's just been effeminized. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, the whole the whole language of of. What, what is known as political correctness or wokeness or whatever is so maternal, you know, welcoming, nurturing, safe spaces. It's, it, these are not the words that men use. So our our liberal churches in North America have definitely said to men, hey, you can come, but we don't need you. And so uh, it, it, so once men are not needed, they're going to go play golf. They're going to go they're going to go somewhere where they can have fun or where they are needed. Um, so once once women become the plurality of leaders, uh, in a church, the men and the men will leave, and the church will decline, and it will go further into theological liberalism. Because here's the truth about women: women will sacrifice rules on the altar of relationships, whereas men will sacrifice relationships on the altar of rules. And when you have a church that has, you know, good representation of both genders, they check each other. But when the men withdraw, the women have no uh, check on their desire to just to please everyone and to keep everyone, to make the church a warm, safe, nurturing place where everyone feels loved and accepted. And they'll actually reinterpret the Bible to to make that, to create that reality where the church is a warm, loving family. And they don't realize that in doing that for the existing members, they're putting up a stop sign for those who might want to join. Okay, now if I understand yeah. you correctly, I love that phrase. You said that women are generally more willing to uh, sacrifice uh, rules at the um, on the altar of relationships. Men will sacrifice relationships on the altar of rules. I can it's hear a- all of the feminists screeching and sharpening their pencils and typing up, uh, booting up their laptops just to write a blog about how bigoted you are right now as we speak. I hear the b- laptops booting up. So I would like to clarify. It seems like you're not saying this needs to be male dominated. You're saying there's we do best when it's actually even and if it's balanced we we get the best of both worlds creating that kind of family nurturing atmosphere which i do believe is necessary for sp- spiritual growth but it cannot be at the cost of you know uh, preaching the true doctrine the the rules as you say and so on and so forth that the body of christ i do believe kind of needs both and we don't get that if you heavily masculinize or emasculate the church is that a fair summary right there oh, i'm going to say what you just said in two minutes i'm going to say it in five seconds <laughs> yeah man <laughs> um, a, a, a church that is female dominated will move toward liberalism a church that is male dominated will move toward legalism they're both errors. Now, the reason the reason progressive Christians don't see their error is because Jesus came to fight legalism. And so he he came in against the legalism of the Pharisees and he brought grace in. And so the assumption that progressive Christians make is we need to just continue down that road of grace, which is true to a point. But you get to the point where there's absolutely no no rules anymore. There's no everybody's doing their own thing or doing it right. What's right in their own eyes, and you lose social cohesion. You you, you dissolve into chaos without rules and standards. And we're seeing this in our cities. You know, with uh, we're we're letting up on drug penalties and you know homelessness is everywhere. We're doing this in the name of compassion and love and care. We're trying to be like Jesus. But we're forgetting that, you know, Jesus not only loved people, but he also set a very high standard for their personal conduct. And men will not align themselves with an institution that has squishy rules. I mean, we're recording the Super Bowl. Can you imagine what would happen if there's a controversy over some rule during the game? I mean, the men are going to rebel. 
a few years ago, the, the referees mm. went on strike and the rules got squishy and they were interpreted wrong and the men were going insane. Uh, the women didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a difference in how we approach things. And one of the reasons men hate going to progressive churches, even they, those who are themselves progressive, is because there's just no rules and no, no standards. Everybody kind of makes it wow. up as they go along. Well, well one, in, one interesting thing that, that sorry, uh, one, one interesting thing that David did early on uh, in his book that, you're, that you'd love, Carton, is he, he took two lists of, of human traits, of values. And he presents them and he, and he does this all the time. And he'll say, all right, so if I list off, you know, high, per, uh, high per, uh, performance, uh, discipline, um, you know, no, keeping you the know, rules. Let, let me set this up for you, okay? Maybe right. You know you know it, Austin. This is great. I love this. Let me, I, I put two, two lists of values on the screen and I say, which set of values best represents those of Jesus Christ and his true followers? Now, on the left, we've got love, communication, beauty, relationships, nurturing, healing, etc., on the left, we've got uh, conquest and and dominion and you know, all these other things that you know, inevitably every group I've ever shown this to, whether they are male or female, Christian or non Christian, they always identify the this love, communication, and beauty as the values of Jesus and His true followers. And then I reveal where those lists are from. They're from Chapter Two of the book. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Got- <laughs> and what happens is audiences always identify the Venus values as those of Jesus. Whereas the Mars values are seen as ungodly. Yep. And yet, if you comb the scriptures, you find just as much Mars as you do Venus. But but everybody thinks of Jesus as this, you know, posy sniffing, peace loving, uh, liberal activist. Uh, especially those who don't even ever read the scriptures, they don't see the whole picture of Jesus. And so, you know, that that sort of Jesus just doesn't has very little appeal for men. So what what do we do to fix this? Like, I, I mean, it, it, so much culture just seeps in through the front and the back door in church. And, um, y- you know, y- you have to push back on the culture, but y- you can't push so fast that all of a sudden you uh, you self manifest as 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 a psychopath. Um, like what <laughs> what's been an effective tool for really making it? making church a place that men want to go to. I mean, you're the guru on this. You literally wrote the book. What's mm-hmm. the fix? Let's talk fixes now. We all see the problems. What What are some of the best fixes that you've noticed in your experience over the past 20 years? Well, the fastest growing churches in America are the mega churches, non-denominational mega churches. And that uniformly, they've gotten rid of the feminine decor, the, the grandma decorating motif. Um, you know, the lace doilies are gone. The felt banners are gone. The communion table is gone. Um, it, the, their worship spaces look more like a conference center or a darkened rock concert venue, which is, you know, a place place guy feels comfortable immediately. It doesn't feel like Aunt Polly's parlor. So, you know, decor is one thing. Men are visual. When they walk into a space, they immediately identify with the space. Um, the second thing is the, the metaphors that we use to describe the Christian life. One of the most popular, uh, probably the most popular phrase that evangelicals use to describe their Christianity is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, interestingly, this phrase never appears in the Bible, yet it's now the number one way we characterize our faith. And of course, if you look at which gender is more into relationships, it's obviously women. Women watch chick flicks that are all about relationships. They buy magazines that are all about relationships. Oh, Brad is dating Jen again. It's, it's women are obsessed with relationships, whereas men are obsessed with mission. You know, what are we here to achieve? And so the more we describe the Christian faith as a relationship with a man who loves you, the more we're the more we're subtly tuning our message to our female um, to our, our women uh, constituency. So, um, you know, those are just a couple of little things that you can do right away is make sure that your language is reflect. Use the language that's in the Bible. It's plenty masculine. We don't need these new metaphors that we've made up. You know, I mean, I, it's it's weird. I go to men's events and the guy will get up there and I'll say, guys, you need to fall deeply in love with Jesus. <laughs> and I'm like, I do. <laughs> we, we just I just tell pastors, you know, stick with the Bible, use the, the rough language that's there. And uh, that'll be a, a good way of telling the men they're valued. And just to get in front of, of critics of this, this philosophy helps women. This helps women. Women want strong men and they want faithful men 
And this helps those men and that helps those women. It's not a zero sum game. Man is incomplete without a woman. Neither is woman without the man. Okay. We're, we're in this gospel together. And so yeah. we need, we yeah, need both. This is well, now and here's an illustration I like to use with pastors. Pastors, they, they start to get scared when I talk about targeting the men. And I tell them this story. Um, Right by my home, there are two large box stores. One is Home Depot. And every Monday night, Home Depot has a do-it-herself night. And women crowd into Home Depot. And they pick up saws, and they pick up hammers, and they put on the safety glasses, and they make things. And the next day, they go back to work. And they say, you'll never guess, girls, what I did last night. I went to Home Depot and learned how to work a bandsaw. And the women are all like, ooh, you are super cool. Now, right next door to Home Depot is another big box store. It's called Joanne Fabrics. Now, I've checked. Joanne Fabrics does not have a do-it-himself night. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot imagine a man going to Joanne Fabrics and the next day going to work saying, hey, guys, let's guess what I did last night. I went to Joanne Fabrics and learned how to make decorative pillow shams. Wow, way to go, dude. All right. Man, you're the- <laughs> See, this is, my, this is what I call Murrow's ironclad rule of the genders. Women do masculine, but men don't do feminine. When women, if it's the first woman to do such and such, yay, we throw a party. But when the first man to do something that women have traditionally done, he goes and hides in the corner. So uh, uh-huh. women gain tremendous social status by breaking through glass ceilings. Men who do the same are shamed. So if your church is targeting women, who are you going to get? You're going to get women. But if you're targeting men, you're going to get men, women, children, sons, daughters. And so I say, target men boldly. This isn't to say you exclude women or you you rebuke women or you don't care for women. But as you as you said, um, Jonah, one of the best ways to bless a woman is to surround her with godly men. That gives her a sense of security, um, especially if she's a single woman looking for companionship. Um, I mean, the pickings are pretty slim these days, uh, both inside and outside the church. And I'm, you know, I've, I've asked Christian girls, you know, what's the dating scene like in the church? And they just give me this look, you know, like I, I, the, it, it's been said that the men of the church are like parking spaces. The good ones are either already taken or they're handicapped. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Savage man. Savage. So, so um what so uh, these women are experiencing this. They would they would love it if there was uh, more men who were serious about serving Christ and serving their families. And uh we just gotta get busy making making more of those guys. Okay. Then um we I, I understand both from your your research and uh and and the secular statistics and everything that yes, uh, we're failing men. We, we, we have to reach out. There's stats to prove this. Deaths of despair are predominantly male and they're only skyrocketing. Homelessness is wildly predominantly male and it's only skyrocketing. Uh, uh, depression, uh, jail populations, uh, those lost in wars, uh, those lost at work. You know, it's. Yeah. And let me jump in here. The big one that you're missing, 20 percent of working age men age 18 to 60 are not in the workforce. They are simply not. They're disappearing from society. 20%? Yeah, it's, 20%. It's, no, it's it's really bad. Holy like, cow. like, And you're not allowed to talk about it because that's bigoted and that's the B word. What do you, what do you say? Like, what's the defense when people hear you saying, for example, like, oh, the, 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 the pickings are slim and men are like parking spots and, and you know, they're, they're, they're either, uh, the good ones are taken or they're handicapped and, and how, how dare we target men? Like men are the problem. That's bigoted male dominance, patriarchy, you know what I'm horses. What do you, uh, what do you say <laughs> when somebody wants to just knee jerk and say, well, that's just, that's just bigoted patriarchy. What, what, what's, what's the response? Cause that's, that's the number one shutdown motif that the shock troops use to shut down any attempt at trying to improve male programs in the church is, oh, oh, that's patriarchy. That's male dominance. That's all those bad things that we've learned so much about and, and how to avoid. Um, what, what's your pushback on that pushback? Well, the question is, what do you want? What do you want the church to look like? Do you want the church to be all a bunch of old women? 
which is what we're seeing in the main line right now. Um, I call them grandmocracies, rule by grandmothers. <laughs> okay. um, and, you know, these churches, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're just disasters because the men have all withdrawn. I think egalitarians think what they picture is men and women serving in equal stead in the church. But when women take over, see, here's the thing. Churches have always had men in the formal leadership positions, and women have run the lay ministries. You've created this yin and yang where the women knew how far they could push it before the men pulled them in, and the men knew, knew how far they how legalistic they could get before the women would pull them back to grace, right? And it creates a very healthy dynamic. But when women control everything in the church, which is what eventually happens, you have nobody pulling back in the in the direction of, hey, what are we here to achieve? What are we here to accomplish? Because relationships are the goal. Creating relational harmony tends to be the goal. We're no longer reaching out. We're no longer sharing our faith. We are keeping the people in, in the church happy. And again, I'm keep beating up on the main line, but in the main line, evangelism now is a bad word. It's cultural imperialism oh, for me boy. to suggest to a person to suggest to someone who practices the Muslim faith that they might need to repent and follow Jesus. Well, that's cultural imperialism. You're trying to change them. Don't do that. Just love them the way Jesus loved everyone. So this is the type of gospel we're seeing in these mainline churches. And it's quickly coming to the evangelical church. I can't speak for the LDS because I haven't done a lot of research there, but I would imagine it too is liberalizing uh, as women take a much greater role. And it's going to go down the same road that all the other uh, that the evangelical churches have as well. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. Well, um, you know, I, for, I could talk to you for hours. Unfortunately, I know that um, you got to go and we've got a, a hard out coming up here pretty soon. But um, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm loving 90% of what I hear, and I think there's easily a, an 85% crossover between uh, the the issues that we have here. Uh, fortunately, I think some of the codification and the heavily organized and correlated structure of our church has installed a couple of backstops against some of the worst aspects of this that other faith, faiths um, may not have, but... It, it, that means that maybe we don't suffer formally from the problem, but culturally we sure as heck do, you know, and, and there's a lot of what you're saying, um, is I'm smelling what you're stepping in for lack of a better term. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm super grateful you were able to come in today and I'm going to put this back up on the screen so, uh, people can, um, can check this out uh, and buy your book, Why Men Hate Going to Church. The author is David Murrow here. If people want to reach out to you, maybe they, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm sure you consult for churches or I'm sure you, uh, uh, you give your two cents worth or uh, I don't know if you do symposiums or whatever, but you're an author. You do the author thing, right? If people mm -hmm. want to reach out to you and get you to do the author thing for them, uh, how can people reach you? How can people find you? What do you recommend? Um, just davidmurrow.com. You can reach out. There's contact links all over the site. You can also see my videos. Um, you can see my books that I've written. You can purchase those on the website and I get 12 cents or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, go to davidmurrow.com. I'd love to, love to hear from you and, uh, love to get your hate mail. If you think I'm a misogynist bigot, okay. but I'm not, <laughs> um, we all, we all want a church where men and women are, are represented well. And the gospel of Jesus Christ moves forward. And we are, and men are a big part of that. And we can't leave them behind. We, we need to, you know, when, when Jesus started his church, he went out, remember what he did. He went out and found six men, six women, and he started a children's ministry, right? Okay. No, he went out and found 12 regular guys and he turned the world upside down with them. So what was he showing us? That he's a misogynist bigot? No, he was showing us that it starts with men. And then out of that comes diversity and growth. So if we take care of our men, if you grow your men, your church will grow. So good, good, good. Oh, 
right guys, thanks for watching the video. Before you go, please make sure that you like the video, share it with your friends, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please let this be the video in which we earn your subscription and that you press the alert button so you're alerted to all of our fun live streams and standalone videos and community posts. Also, if you'd like to help us out, please consider joining the channel. Members get all kinds of cool perks and benefits. They get early access to a lot of our videos and special emoticons and emojis during our live streams and preferential treatment there. It's a lot of fun. Speaking of a lot of fun, we have a super cool Discord. If you'd like to join our Discord, check us out on wardradio.com. There's a link to the Discord there. Also, you can sign up there for our newsletter. Our newsletter is a lot of fun and you can put your email address in there. And if you'd like to contribute to the program, please consider looking us up on Venmo or on the Cash app. We're on both of those platforms. Also, if you just want to keep watching more content right about here and probably right about here are going to be some more videos. Please check those out. And as always, for this and more, please make sure that you look us up and check us out at wardradio.com.